Um, I'm not sure. Nice to meet David you. Cousin, nice How nice are to you? meet you. Thank you. I, I hope this wasn't a guitar related injury. <laughs> no, it might have been. I, I sound very loud all of a sudden. It might have been a, you know, re repetitive. Uh, no, ouch. But I, I, I don't have the goods to show for it, unfortunately. <laughs> so, um, so we both picked. Um, we both pick pedal point songs. We both pick drones. Because um, Dear Prudence has one chord until they sing come out to play. And mm -hmm. Tomorrow Never Knows, the song I picked, is basically one chord with another chord laid on top of it once in a while. Yeah. Um, but but your, your essay on Dear Prudence is just so great. Thank um, you. It's just like the, 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 the way you go, like you microscopically analyze it. But um, why did you pick that song? I mean, why, I mean, did that song leap out of the White Album to you? Or well, was, well, it something, have, was it something like came to you later? No, no, I've always liked that song I, uh, since I had the White Album, and it would be one of the first albums that I had. Um, back when, when you had to buy albums, and you had to save up to buy albums, and, you know, to be asked to buy a double album was outrageous. <laughs> Because I think I say in the essay that at that point I was really buying singles. I would go to the Woolworths on 14th Street, maybe you remember? 8th Street, 9th Street. It was close. And I'd buy 45s because I thought that, that's the way to get music. You only get the good songs. You know, you know? And the, the White Album would have been one of the first you know, albums that I, that I got that had what I saw as filler at that point, you know, <laughs> like, why don't we do it in the road and things like, was not that on that album too? Yeah. And I was a little offended that I had spent all my money <laughs> and the Beatles were throwing some throwaways at me. But uh, actually, I really like Why Don't We Do It in the Road Now. Uh, Piggy's not so much. Piggy's on it? With the harpsichord, yes. It's hard, it's hard to defend Piggy's, isn't it? <laughs> at the time, it probably seemed like a protest. Okay, then that's a good defense. That, that went over my head at the time. Um, but uh, Dear Prudence, just I, I just, I can remember, I mean, as I said in the essay, I just remember it, it, it felt like such a beautiful song and such a sad song. And um, what you call the, the, the droning of it the, um, was hypnotic to me, you know. And um, I had no, I, I, I didn't play a, an instrument. I, I didn't know anything about music. Um, but I, I certainly could be hypnotized by a song, and I think I would play that over and over. You know, have to put the arm <laughs> as we were full. Maybe that's how I heard myself. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in, in your essay, you talk about the way the instruments sort of creep in one by one and how they change yeah. the spirit of the song. Yeah. Um, it's a beautifully it, produced song. It's a very dramatic song. Um, I think when I go back now and I listen to, to certain, certainly later Beatles songs, they have a great sense of, of adding instrumentation in, uh, whether it's George Martin or, or whoever was the genius behind that. But it really gives their songs a sense of uh, like a journey to the song. You know, a, a, something has changed from the beginning. And I think Dear Prudence, definitely uh, the bass. You know, Paul's such a brilliant bass player. The, the melodies of his bass lines are so beautiful. And in this, in this song, it's very kind of insistent and uh, like a heartbeat in a way. And it, it, I, I think, I, again, I just think I was moved, uh, you know, on a nonverbal level by that. The, the other thing I, I always loved about Beatles songs is there's always a little surprise at the end. There's always yeah. a little extra twist at the end. Yeah. And Dear Prudence has all those harmonies yeah. sort of blossoming around. Yeah. It. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I think that's definitely true. And I also think I remember reading once that George Martin had had worked in comedy beforehand, and that the Beatles often thought of themselves as a very funny group. That they were making funny music, and I you get that feeling sometimes that they can't wait to be funny, you know. <laughs> and sometimes it happens at the end of a song. Yeah, well, it happens in Tomorrow Never Knows with that. Suddenly, piano in the middle of the right. in the middle of the transcendental drone. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I wrote about that one because because I'm, I'm a music geek, yeah. and uh, that that song is uh, 
that song is just the music nerd song supreme. <laughs> there's, 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 you know, the, with the tape loops and, and the drone and the right. crazy stuff. Was, um, it, was that the, uh, what's that called? That synthesizer that, the, that goes in a circle? Leslie. The Leslie? The Leslie, yeah. the John Le Yeah, John, actually, I mean, I think I was kind of prescient about writing about that song, knowing that this event would happen since it's, we're here at the Rubin and it's based on the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Um, so, you know, months ago as I was agonizing, it, it was a rough choice, which, which song? It must have been a rough choice for you, too. I don't know, it was just kind of the first thing that popped in my head, so I, I don't think it was, um, it was rough. But, see? But you were probably going like, you know, I've always wanted to write that book about, you know, the best 40 songs based on the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And you're like, <laughs> Tomorrow never knows. That, that, like that was that. it. That was that was my yeah. real motivation. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the I see. I'm, 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 as a music critic, I was like, oh, you know, which song is the most? Well, there's so much pressure on you. There's no pressure on me. Yeah. <laughs> nobody, nobody expects me to say anything interesting or or in any way musical. You know, so I, I feel. I'm, I mean, I'm impressed that you you came to the plate there. And, <laughs> Well, the, but, but, it, but clearly from the essay, you really listen. Well, yeah, I mean, I love music. I've always, as a kid, I loved it too. I mean, it was truly uh, my companion, you know, so. so and, and there was so much less music back then, you know, that was available. Yeah. Uh, I could only hear it in my house. I only had a few records. As I said, it was uh, expensive. So the records that I had, I really dug in. Mm -hmm. And uh, whether or not they were meaningful, I made them meaningful. You know, they became meaningful to me. Yeah. So sometimes I, you know, I think it's great that there's so much music out there, and sometimes I think it's it's horrible. I can't, I, I can't, I change every day. Okay. Well, I mean, we, we grew up in the same sonic environment. Right. There was like WABC for the, for the top forty, and there was whatever records. PLJ. Yeah, PLG for the FM. <laughs> But it was whatever records you could scrounge together mm -hmm. and, and buy. But they were. I used to go to this place called Free Being, on. Uh, yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah, on Eighth Street. I lived on Eleventh and Second. I grew up there, so Free Being was on Eighth and Second, and uh, they had a lot of. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, just I turned right into now. Charlie Brown's father, just sort of <laughs> back and forth. Uh, they had they had bootlegs there, and that was my way of it was my way of being frugal. And I thought I was outsmarting the system because the bootlegs would always be like a greatest hits. You know, it would be a concert, so they'd play the singles, and I'd always jump and oh, I got everything on this album. And then you take it back, and it sounded like it was recorded in the toilet. You know? <laughs> yeah, the, the cassette machine under the under the yeah. balcony seat. <laughs> exactly. Good 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 microphone placement. Yeah. yeah. Um, speaking of microphone placement, John Lennon wanted. Tomorrow never knows to sound like monks chanting from the top of a mountaintop. So, mm. uh, which was which really was a good thing to tell your producer. Yeah. <laughs> we, uh, the the um, but I, I do think the 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 the, the drone is, is is I mean they did they used it in the word, but then they also had it they had it running through um, I'll be back too. Sean explained, which I didn't realize. The pedal, uh, pedal yeah, I, point. I, I heard that too. Yeah, um, yeah. that uh, y it gives you a gives you a sense of groundedness, I guess. Gives well, you I a mean, sense of eternity. Just, just sitting here thinking about it, I, I I wonder sometimes why I like certain new bands, like for instance, not that U2 is new, but I think that the Edge's kind of droning guitar is very Beatlesque to me now as I think about it. From a song like Dear Prudence, I could hear if you sped it up, it could sound like a U2 song. You know that kind of droning yeah. sameness of that ringing. So a lot of the times I'll realize that I, I like noon music because it reminds me of what I've already liked, which is very boring, I know. <laughs> but I think, I, think, <laughs> he's, I think he's trying to guess who's going to talk, and I keep on, <laughs> I keep on jumping in. I, I, I th and I've forgotten. But, uh, Were you talking about new music that, that, that draws yeah. on old music? Yeah, I think, I think, I think our ears get customized in a way to certain sounds that we like you know and 
and molded. And the, and the Beatles are definitely the most pervasive musical influence for mm -hmm. my, my generation. And, and uh, yeah. you know, so well, it's even impossible to say whether we like it anymore. It's just, it's just part of us. They also tried so many things. Yeah. I mean, you, my, you, you, you can build whole schools of music on a lot of Beatles songs. Right. You can build the raspberries on top of some Beatles songs. Mm -hmm. You can build, I mean, Tomorrow Never Knows, you can build um, you know, minimalism on. Mm -hmm. um, Dear Prudence, you can build a whole sort of psychedelic realm on top of. Right. Um, you, you, you came to that song pre-drugs, right? You were young. <laughs> I mean, pre, pre uh, ex, I well, mean, you read the essay. You read I was 10. Yeah. <laughs> well, when hope to was pre drug. But, but, but so me not. too. I mean, we. we, we <laughs> but but we, we plugged into those songs without need of psychedelics. Yeah. For me, the, the, the pot music was yes. <laughs> that's, when I got, that's when I got lost. <laughs> and have you returned to it since? I don't mind some yes. I'll put on some yes. Roundabout. If, if I got you know a two-hour drive ahead and I want to hear a <laughs> one song, twenty-minute bass solo. <laughs> are, are, are there other Beatles songs that you you own in the same way as Dear Prudence? Uh, that are like part the of long you? and winding road. I think I thought about writing, which just makes me cry every time I hear it. Uh, it's just a beautiful song. Uh, let it be, you know. I, 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 it's no surprise, but uh, Hey Jude also. Um, any of any of those, I I never get tired of, of hearing those songs. I can always listen to those songs. Well, you you wrote about in Dear Prudence the sense of optimism at the end. Mm -hmm. I mean yeah. the the and those other ones you mentioned too. Yeah, there's always a sense of of uplift in those songs. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think. Uh, it's, uh, I could be speaking out of my ass here, but it's hard to, a lot of Beatles songs are, are even though John was definitely a, a pessimistic person, uh, he did, I, maybe it was Paul tempering him, but, but a lot of the songs, at least, you know, you talk about the journey of it, they get to a point of optimism, I think, I don't know. Day in a life? <laughs> uh, I'd have to listen to it. So. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's such a great song. Have you heard Jeff Beck's uh, version? Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, I like it. What, do, have, has, has being a Beatles fan carried over into other stuff you do? I mean, because acting requires timing, directing requires timing. You're, you're thinking about things elapsing in time. Mm hmm I mean, and music elapses in time as well. Yeah. I don't know if I could, if I could answer, answer it literally. Um, you know, you get back to the um, the simplicity of the songs, you know. And I think as I as I become an older performer, artist, whatever it is that I am, you know, you start to you start to get more simplistic again, you know, and you realize that. That's the hardest thing, is to be simple. Uh, whereas when you're younger, you think the hardest thing is to, you know, just whatever, you know, be Alvin Lee. Right. Um, but the hardest thing is to just throw three or four or five and chords together and a couple sevens and <laughs> write a beautiful melody and some words that are shadowing mm -hmm. something but not quite getting it. It seems simple, but it's not, and that's... It's the same with acting and directing, I would imagine, um, is to just uh, keep it real and keep it simple. Strip, strip it down mm -hmm. and, uh, and get to the point. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, uh, you, you do, I guess everybody goes through the shredding phase yeah. of, of music appreciation, mm -hmm. um, but you do, you do get past it. Well, that would be my yes phase. You know, yeah, that would be my progressive rock phase, super too. Super complicated. And I think in many Wow, way, they can play fast. Isn't that they amazing? They can play fast. And, they, you know, and I think in many ways it, it, it inhibited me from becoming mm -hmm. a musician at that point because I was like, I could never play like those guys. 
You know, you listen to a Beatles album and you can play like those guys. You know, they're good musicians. You play, maybe not like Paul, but you can, you can play guitar like John. You can even play guitar like George. Yeah. But I don't think you can play guitar like Steve Howe. <laughs> True. And, but, but the genius of their songwriting is how much sneaky little sophistication they pack Absolutely. in. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, uh, George, uh, I, I appreciate, as I've, as I've made some music, I appreciate George's guitar work, uh, you know, because at the time, um, you know, it was, all, it was Clapton, it was uh, Hendrix, it was uh, Townsend. You know, you never heard about, you know, George was like, he was a good songwriter, but you'd never think of him as a guitarist like that. But he's so economical and so melodic and, and rhythmic. And uh, again, simple. Yeah, the, the, and, the, and he, his eight bars go somewhere and finish what they had to say. Right. Uh, I, I, I was a latecomer to loving Ringo's drumming, which is the best. It's so is it perfect. Really? He, he doesn't use drum rolls because he right. apparently didn't feel technically gifted enough to do a drum roll. But um, I mean, one of the Beatles said, best backbeat in the business. Mm. Um, and that's that's all you need. Yeah, is is what he does in those songs. If he was flashier, if he was more ornamental, you just get in the way. And I think you have to you have to grow up or be a beetle to know that. Right, right. But but I mean, I, I keep learning for those. I mean, doing the research for this book, um, you know, I kept going to another song, another song's like, oh wow, they did that. And I was listening to Dear Prudence again yesterday before talking to you, and it's like. Right. Oh wow, that happens in the second verse. You know, yeah. look what those harmonies do. Yeah. It's like there's just so many treats in these songs. It's like a it's like a three act play, you know, or it's like thesis antithesis, you know, synthesis a lot of times in their song. I do hope she comes out at the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't. I think I think there's a real story behind mm -hmm. it, which I don't know. Uh, there is a real story behind it, yes. which which I don't know, and and she may have come out. At the end, I'm not sure. Did she come out? Yeah, pretty sure. All right, she came out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, anyway, thank you. Pleasure to talk to you. I'm <laughs> nice to meet you. Good to meet you. You're staying, I think. Yeah, I think. Great uncle was called Hank Moody, so oh, I was always really? thinking I should take it personally. Well, only you would know if it is personal. I, mean, I, I, I think you should probably answer that question because, well, of course, I didn't write any of, of that, but uh, Tom Kapanos, I, I'm sure, is a big fan of yours. Huh? And uh, I, I don't know if he knew anything about your personal life at all. Huh? I, I, I don't think so. <laughs> But it was definitely a, a com it was meant as a compliment, I'm sure. All right, <laughs> I'll take it as such. And it, it is, it's all right to go down the street and have people yell Moody at you. It feels right, <laughs> doesn't it? It's been going on for me for a long yeah, exactly. time. Yeah, yeah. And um, the, I think there was a, a book that you wrote recently where you have me enter a party. Is that right? Me? And I, I think you might have turned up in one briefly. Yeah. yeah, and I was like, how the fuck did that happen? Yeah. <laughs> because I never went to that party. Yeah. But it's she just had me at the party, and I was reading it, and I was thinking, oh my God, something hor I'm going to do something horrible. I'm going to say something horrible is going to happen to me, and I was cool. I kind, was, of, I kind of drifted through and drifted out. Yeah, that was just meant to be about the Hank Moody thing. Oh, just was. for a second. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. so now we've got it. We've yeah. covered it. I guess we have to talk about the Beatles. <laughs>
Yeah. Yeah. What did you write on? I wrote on the medley section of Abbey Road, in particular, um, Golden Slumbers Carry That Weight, The End. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I wrote about those songs. Um, well, I was in Connecticut when you were growing up here mm -hmm. in Fairfield County. And uh, my parents, they weren't big rock and roll people, but they had Abbey Road for some reason. And it was coterminous with their marriage ending. And uh, so, no, it's sad. It's not <laughs> funny. It's sad. Mm. And, uh, and so somehow for me, I have this allegorical reading of Abbey Road, which is that Abbey Road is, is about the Beatles ending, or the medley side right. especially is a lot about the Beatles ending. Um, and were, so I, Were you aware of that at the time? No, I no. just thought, I, I read the songs as though they were about my parents' marriage. And, yeah. yeah. And so Golden Slumbers for me, everybody knows Golden Slumbers, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I was watching my parents sort of do their Fairfield County ice stormy breaking apart and sort of craving the kind of parents who would sing you a lullaby at right. the same time that I was hearing that song, you know? So Golden Slumbers for me summons up the ache right. of that time. But, you know, that whole medley goes through to the end in the end part, you know? Right. And it's so, like you, I'm, I'm a passionate George Harrison fan. And the way that that last bit of the medley goes into his really incredible little guitar figure Right. That may even only be like two bars, not even eight bars. But that, and the strings come in, there's that sort of soaring um, uh, completion of the mission of the Beatles in a way that to me was a happy ending that I sorely needed at that right. time. Yeah. And at what, what age were you when you came to that? You, you, you didn't come to that at that age, did you? No, I think probably I, I treated those songs really intuitively yeah. at that time, the way you treated Dear Prudence right. intuitively. Um, Isn't it too bad that we can't treat things intuitively forever? Well put. Yeah, yeah sometimes, sometimes with music it's really important to unlearn all right. the sm smart-ass stuff you have yeah. and try and feel the songs, yeah. which is, I sort of tried to get at that in the essay that sometimes in life, you know, something dreadful can happen, death, grief, you know, and suddenly all the accumulated layers of fuzz over the music evaporate and you can hear a song again yeah. the way you felt about it when you first heard it, right. you know. It's hard to come to those moments. You have to be in pain. Pain. Yeah, to get back there. Yeah. Happiness won't do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's some other songs from that period that I find somewhat objectionable now, like um, Wild World by Cat Stevens. But See, I, which, I, love, I love Cat Stevens. You like that song? I like that song. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's condescending, yes, and it's... Yeah, it's, kind of, sure it's a it's mansplaining song. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> but we could do that with a lot of songs from yeah, the time. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But some, sometimes, every now and then, there'll be a moment where I see through my cool, bohemian hatred of Cat Stevens, and I go underneath it. And you feel it. And I can feel it again. Yeah. yeah. You know, father and son gets me every time. Father and son. <laughs> yeah. And it can't be cheesier, right? But it's, it's, yeah. it's the right kind of cheese. Yeah. <laughs> what kind of cheese is that? <laughs> it's a cat cheese, I think. <laughs> yeah. Actually, to be literal. But I, I feel like uh, it, it, is, it is a difficult thing to hear the Beatles for the first time. Yeah. Because it's, it, it's, it, it's everywhere. And... Um, you know, it's, it's kind of something I've been thinking about a lot recently, just, just uh, you know, pervasively 
I haven't been able to see a movie or a television show without knowing way more about it than I want to know before I sit down and mm. watch it. Yeah. And I think it's a serious problem for trying to approach any kind of artistic endeavor. Yeah. You know, it's like insider trading. And, yeah. And uh, I don't know what the answer is. And I don't know if it has anything to do with what we're talking about here. And I don't know why I'm talking about it. But, <laughs> but it's like just... In a sense, like going to a Beatles song is, is being overloaded already that way. Yeah. With, with all your childhood associations. And to, to get to that beautiful moment where you get to hear it again as if for the first time is, is a beautiful moment. You know, Sean was mentioning the Beatles channel on Sirius. And, and I've been listening to it sort of obsessively in the car. And uh, Martha, my dear, came yeah. on the other, the other morning when I was driving which is a song, I believe I'm correct, that Martha, my dear, is about a dog. Did you know that? A sheepdog. And, That's um, important. It's a sheepdog. Yeah. Because <laughs> if it were... Yeah. But if it were a Basenji, it wouldn't be as good. Is Basenji, no. No, yeah. Um, but anyway, I always used to hate Martha, my dear. Did, did you like Martha, my dear? No, because, I mean, as, as a kid, anything that's... Even in ballads, I was skeptical of. I mean, I wanted like rock and roll, you know. So anything that didn't sound like rock and roll to me, I was like, "What are they doing?" Yeah, you know, they're, it sounds like something my parents would listen to. Yeah, but I, I like that song. Huh? It's a pretty song. I hated it as a teenager because it was about a dog. So to oh. me, it was perforce cheap. You did, you did not like Barry Manilow's Mandy. That's about a dog too. <laughs> And then there was Me and You and a Dog Named Blue, right? Lobo. Lobo is the band, right? Or the guy. Yeah, the guy. Yeah. But anyway, and then I heard Martha My Dear on the Beatles channel, and it's an incredible song. Like, that too has that major minor thing. There's this sort of soaring bridge section and um, beautiful arrangement, and then it kind of rocks out in the chorus right. a tiny bit. So I think just it had been recontextualized by being on the Beatles channel. <laughs> and I was able to get underneath the cynicism about the dog, right. the Basenji. <laughs> well, for me, it, was, it would probably be, why don't we do it on the road, which I was uh, yeah. mystified by and scared of when I heard when I was a kid. Yeah. <laughs> and now I just think it's a really funny, funny song. Yeah. And a great song. Yeah. If not the most varied composition. And there was that moment when Paul sang with the super gruff voice, yeah. <laughs> like on that song. Right. And he never does that anymore. I no, don't think. no. I think he must have hurt his throat or something like that. Well, I, I think it gets, it gets a little into, uh, you know, kind of that American blues man imitation. Yeah, exactly. I think, I think with time, much like Cat Stevens' lyrics, yeah. it might be politically sensitive. Oh, Paul that's interesting. Um, yeah. That's just my feeling. I mean, go back and listen to like early Mick Jagger. It's like, whoa. Yeah. It's like blackface. I mean, it's yeah. very... <laughs> I mean, I'm not making a joke. It's, it's, it's co-opting, you know? Yeah. So that would be my guess. So did, what other Beatles records did you like as a kid? Abbey Road I loved. It was yeah. Over and over and over. Uh, Let It Be. Um, I didn't really get into the early, early stuff. I was born in 60, so 65, 66. Was, I was too young to listen to the, the big poppy hits before they kind of went into their full flower of their creativity. So Sgt. Pepper, uh, Abbey Road, and uh, Let It Be, probably, and the White Album. I mean, I had that same... I'm 61, so from 1961. Right. So I had the same... Um, point of entry yeah. and really I remember going in first grade to some guy's house and, and listening to um, Back in the USSR right and, yes that's and a great song. you know I had heard some of the earlier hits but that was the first time I put the needle yeah. down on the record and yeah blown away by the uh, by the airplane sound the airplane sound <laughs> yeah yeah and, and the word time. balalaikas balalaikas <laughs> yeah it scans well yeah it does yeah it's iambic I guess isn't it no, we'll get to, we'll figure that out later. 
But the ballad, it's the karma. Uh, Sean mentioned this John Lennon tribute. I, I was, I was, I hosted it and, and sang uh, "Instant Karma," which is a John song after the Beatles, and that was always one of my favorite. Still is one of my favorite tunes. Really? Yeah, I love that song. I find the John Lennon solo period vexing. <laughs> <laughs> Continue. I mean, I like certain songs, and then there are great periods of half measures, mm -hmm. like Sometime in New York City. Mm -hmm. You know that album? No. That's why. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I think he, he, wrote, he wrote a handful of songs that were as good as Beatles songs. Yeah, you know? yeah. Certainly, Imagine is a career Je maker. Je Jealous Guy, yeah. Instant Karma, uh, Imagine. I like watching The Wheels a lot. You know, Beautiful song. song. Yeah. yeah. I heard Beautiful Boys on the Beatles station also, which I find utterly loathsome. <laughs> <laughs> Impossible to yeah. listen to. Yeah. Yeah. How about Who Has Seen the Wind? Can you sing some? Have you, do you know Who Has Seen the Wind? We've gone out and that's the Yoko song. Oh, that's on Double Fantasy? What album is that on? <laughs> <laughs> no? Yeah. Plastic Ono Band. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. No, you wouldn't want me to sing that. No, I, I love Yoko's Plastic Ono Band yeah. album. That's yeah. great. Well, I think it's the Karma's on that, isn't it? No, that's on his. No, that's oh, okay. on I Mind see, I, Games. I don't know. I, I'm over my head. Yeah. Yeah. We should just let them talk. I, <laughs> well, I mean, we're just, we're just bullshitting up here anyway. So, so, so. But, uh, and, and, you know, since, since you haven't, you can gong, gong me at any time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So you you know you're not you're not the biggest uh, Lennon solo fan. For me, for me it was interesting to watch Lennon and McCartney, and George just did amazing work. Yeah. So, right. So, but to listen to Paul's work was interesting because he he's so melodically gifted. I would be frustrated because there'd be he'd have four or five really good tunes in one song. Yeah. And I'd get confused and tired. You know, and in fact, I would fantasize or, or I'd speculate that John used to say, you know, fuck that, Let, you know, like two melodies, three, <laughs> you know, like it felt like, but Paul can just spin them out, spin them out. And each one is beautiful, you know, like Live and Let Die or Uncle Albert, you know, and I'm like, well, where's the song? There are four great songs, but it, in the end, it kind of weighed down the entire experience for me anyway. As yeah. A, as a kid listening to him. And then I would kind of imagine how they work together. You know, which I'm sure is completely false, the way I'm thinking of it. But that was mine. There's this incredible essay by David Ulin, who writes for uh, L.A. Times, or he used to write for the mm -hmm. L.A. Times. He wrote an essay that's the album, the the great Beatles album that you would make from 1975 if you just took the best songs from the contemporaneous solo albums of the Beatles and made an album out oh, of yeah. that. Amazing. Maybe I'm amazed on it. Well, maybe I'm amazed. I, might I, be one. I or, love that song. Yeah, or uh, you know, uh, George's um, "Isn't It a Pity" mm -hmm. or "My Sweet Lord." Yeah, there are even a couple of good Ringo songs from that album the called Ringo. Yeah, or "Photograph." Yeah. I think "Photograph" is an amazing song. Actually, I disagree. You disagree? <laughs> I just. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have to stay, right? What? I mean, now you have to stay. I have to stay. Good luck. Thanks. Francine Prose. <laughs> <laughs>